So hello everybody and welcome. This is the first session of the How To Talks series for fall 2021. The How To Talks by Postdocs is a lunchtime series where we bring in postdocs from the VCU community to talk about their work and specifically to talk about how to do something. So these talks are a little bit different than a standard research seminar where you learn about somebody's work or the cool things that they're doing in their career. The How To Talks are really about teaching the audience how to do something related to science. So it can be anything from mentoring to mass spec, and we have a lot of great talks this year. So if you haven't registered for those, um, I'll put a link to the website in the chat in just a minute, and you can go ahead and check out what we have coming up every Monday for the month of October. Today, we have a really exciting opportunity to do a sponsored session, which is telling a scientific story that is approachable and accessible. And this talk will feature me, Dr. Stacy Wall, and my great colleague over in Cabell Library, Oscar Keys. And we'll be talking about various aspects of presentations and doing all of the things. Okay, so here we go. All right. Ah, I'm controlling Keys' screen. Um, from my computer, which is new for me. So just bear with me as I push all of the buttons. There we go. Okay. So at the end of today's session, we really want you guys to be able to identify how your audience impacts the way you talk about your science, and then to understand the basic accessibility design principle principles and be able to apply those principles to modify current presentations that you have or to create new presentations. And so to begin, I don't know why it really doesn't like my arrow keys, but that's okay. I just want you guys to either unmute or throw it in the chat. Who do you talk to your, who do you talk about your science with? Okay, so when you're thinking about giving a seminar or doing a talk, who are you talking to? Great, great. I'm seeing some answers come in the chat right now. Lots of variety from colleagues to undergrads, other scientists. Mm -hmm. Customer stakeholders. I love the phrase stakeholder or the term stakeholders. Uh, it just sounds so official. Yes, lots of different people, politicians, excellent, excellent community. So we know already, we've identified that there are a wide variety of people who want to hear about our work, which is great. It is such an exciting opportunity to be able to talk to different types of audiences and help them learn about what you do and what's exciting to you. And so what we're gonna talk about now is some general considerations for those people groups. And then we're gonna talk about some specific people groups and how these considerations play out for those people. And so the thing I really wanna start with is to think about the experience that's gonna come up. There's a whole sentence there, I promise you. There we go. So the breadth of background knowledge and experience the people you're talking to have, and that's both in terms of general science and your research. And so taking a moment at the start of making a presentation to really consider that even just jotting it down, what is the least experienced person in your audience gonna bring to the table versus what is the most experienced person in the audience gonna bring to the table? And what kind of spectrum is that? And when you're thinking about how to structure your talk, what I like to think about is to make it so that most of your audience is gonna understand what you're talking about most of the time. So you're not going for global understanding, right? I think that would be something that would be hard to reach in general, but um, <laughs> stakeholders, sorry, I just looked over and saw that stakeholders is a project management term and I love it. Um, but you're not gonna be able to get everyone to understand everything all the time. So Targeting most people most of the time is a great way to make sure that you're balancing your talk in terms of what you're bringing to the table with background knowledge. The next thing to think about and to really spend some time considering is why are they listening to you, okay? So, sorry guys, there we go. So everyone is gonna be coming to your talk with an agenda. 
either they are looking to hire you or it's people that you might end up working with, either like a student rotating in your lab who wants to learn about the work or a potential colleague at your next position. So work with you can kind of have a broad definition in itself, or it could just be to simply learn from you. Thinking about this why really informs what you put into your talk. For example, if someone is looking to hire you, they're interested in how much excitement you have about your job and what your vision is for the job that you're applying for and the technical expertise that you that you possess on your research is valuable but might not be where you want to spend the bulk of your time okay whereas if it's someone who's there to learn about you and learn about your research that might the technical aspect might be where you spend more time and then the last thing we want folks to consider is the size of your audience if you're giving a talk to something like this where you see 30 people, it could be a group where you have interaction. When we think about size, what I want you to consider is both how you can do, how can you assess the understanding of your audience and how you can address questions, okay? So these are the two things to think about in terms of size. If you're in a room with 300 people in it, the likelihood that you're gonna be able to see an individual person with a question or check for understanding by looking at people's faces around the room is a little bit low. Okay, and understanding that going into it enables you to build in checkpoints into your talk to do those things. Whereas if you're in and presenting to your lab and it's a group of 12 people sitting around a table, you'll be able to assess your understanding much differently because the people that you're talking to are much closer to you. Does that make sense? Excellent. So. Knowing all of these things in mind, we're going to jump into a couple people groups and just go over where their knowledge and expertise really falls along these spectrums. So talking to lab members. So if you are giving a lab presentation, these are the people that are going to be closest to your project and most interested in that minute technical detail of your work. These are the people that you're going to bring a Western blot to and say, my control looks crappy and I don't know why. And they're going to care about why and want to help you fix that. So that is the most detailed and most invested audience that you're really going to hit when you're talking about your research. Conference attendees, their level of detail is going to vary based on the type of conference that you're going to. If you are an oligodendrocyte biologist and you're going to Society for Neuroscience, there's going to be a lot of people in your audience who don't know much about what oligodendrocytes do. And that's okay, but that's something that we consider when we're building our presentations. Okay, next we have potential mentors. These are some of those people that are gonna be assessing you as much as assessing your work. And the same goes for potential colleagues. Those folks are really gonna be assessing you, but maybe in a different way. Instead of thinking about, are you a good person to employ? They're thinking about, are you a good person to work with? Are you a good colleague? What can what are you bringing to the table that's going to add to our work environment? Okay, and so there's more details in these slides, but I'm kind of skating over them because I really want us to have time to get into the second portion of our talk, which is about making your talk approachable and accessible to these audiences. And for that, I'm going to turn it over to my wonderful colleague. Awesome. Well, thank you for that awesome uh, setup, Stacey. Um, I'm Oscar Keys, and as Stacey mentioned, I'm the Multimedia Teaching Learning Librarian over at Cabell. And one of the things I get lots of questions about uh, has been, how can I make my presentations more accessible? And usually people mean like, how can I make them look prettier? <laughs> um, but as we've learned over time, actually there's some things that we can do to really make our presentations accessible to people with disabilities, folks who um, might not be able to access information the way that we all ex we think we think we're communicating clearly we think we have the best design and actually there's some key things that we've missed along the way that can make it really difficult to access the information that we care so deeply about so what we're going to do is i'm going to sort of bop through the five these five areas that i have found to be the most like beginner friendly um these are five places that i couldn't quite find assembled anywhere else on the internet to kind of create a starting point for you to start thinking about your presentation materials through a lens of accessibility. And the very first thing we're going to be talking about is using themes. Um, and I know there's a lot of, you know, shade towards themes. We're going to talk about why there's actually some advantages to using them. 
we're gonna be talking some of the basics of design, but maybe not, this is how we make it super pretty versus this is how we can make sure everybody can see what's on the screen. We're gonna be talking some about images um, and how to make sure that these images can be understood by things like screen readers. We'll be talking a lot about screen readers themselves and then how we can actually export our Google Slides or PowerPoint into PDFs that can be shared through conference apps and different things that are still readable by all these different software. So if that sounds like a lot, I hope these this little bit more digestible as we kind of uh, bop through this. So the first thing we're going to talk about themes. Um, if any of you ever took a computer class in high school, you'll know that learning about PowerPoint themes was really cheesy. Uh, lots of people have a, a lot of harsh feelings about the color and font choices and things like that. But one of the things that you don't know about themes is that they actually have baked in metadata that says this is a title, this is a paragraph, this is an image. And what that does is it makes it super easy for a screen reader to identify the pieces and put it in the right order. If you're someone like me who is like, I know how to make my own design, I'm going to drop text boxes everywhere. Um, what that does to a screen reader is create absolute chaos. And we're going to look at an example of that later. Um, but one of the things that Stacy and I talked a lot about was like, well, if the theme is there, can we modify it? And so what I'm going to do is get really meta for a second. <laughs> and I'm going to jump out of my presentation and show that we've got our themes here. And you can see themes, these are the change places. However, if I want to edit a theme, let me stretch this out a little bit. Um, I can go to view and find theme builder. And this is where I can see my ability to add and change the different themes. And what you can see here is that Stacy has added her roadmap directly into the theme and then changed where that text is. So she's modifying a theme to meet her needs, but she's not getting rid of the edit title style or the first level, second level. These two boxes are so critical for screen readers to understand what you've asked them to read. So this is just one extra step um, that you can go into if you want a little bit of customizability. Um, putting it into the theme also means that the screen reader doesn't have to read that image every time. It just understands it as a decorative element. Uh, we're going to show you a fun little hack we did to make sure that it actually does the roadmap thing that we want it to do. Um, but I just wanted you all to feel like you could look into a theme um, and play with the layout some. Um, and what's nice about a built-in theme, they will have these multiple different layouts versus, as we found out, some of the official VCU templates only have one or two layouts. Some of them don't actually include a paragraph. <laughs> so these are things also that you're welcome to email me about, um, and we can make sure that your templates themselves are screen reader friendly, because um, I fully understand that there are VCU-specific templates out there. Okay, so that's a little bit about themes. Um, it saves automatically. And you can just close out. Um, you can also download themes from other places. Um, and in general, what you're looking for is when you click this drop down window, you should see all the different types of layouts. Um, that's really the big, the big piece there. All right. So now I'm going to go back into presentation mode. Okay. The next thing that we're going to talk about is design. Um, this is going to be about contrast and colors. Uh, a couple of things that I have learned a lot more about is the phenomenon of vibrating colors, which is what's happening here with the red and green. Uh, very often, I know that I use a lot of color when I'm teaching like on the arts. And one of the things I was never really thinking about was, oh, maybe my choice in colors is actually distracting or detracting from my students' abilities to take in the information. Um, we found out while we were doing this that actually the VCU yellow on white is not a high enough contrast to be legible by most people's visual uh, visual levels. Um, so these are just a couple of examples of high visibility and low visibility in contrast. Uh, one of the examples that I thought was really important for folks in the sciences was graphs. I know that we use colors a lot to designate different graphs. This is an example of what can happen if someone has color blindness and you've used uh, different colors that actually will look to the same to someone with color blindness. And so your data does not communicate uh, 
what you're hoping it will, right? Your visual aid is actually becoming a hindrance. Um, I've included the source uh, for understanding colorblindness, uh, which has a lot of helpful examples. Um, there are also these two great tools. Um, the Web Aim Contrast Checker is one of my favorites. It lets you drop in any colors and get a, a pass or fail if there's a high enough contrast. Uh, Coblis will be a colorblind simulator, and so it lets you see all of your images in particular or graphs uh, in different styles. But when in doubt, the thing I have found to be the easiest is to understand if my image and my slides are all viewable in grayscale. And so sometimes what I might actually do is just print out a copy of my slides in black and white and sort of get a sense of what's legible and what's not. Um, this image, I think, really hits home how the way that color that we think creates a lot of contrast and makes things really clear can actually make things very unclear uh, for folks with visual disabilities. Um, another trick that I recently learned about was that you can adjust the saturation or basically like how blue or how green something is to create contrast along here. So that's what's happening is they've just barely changed the shades of these colors and it creates this really different sense um, even though they're still using colors. So this bottom example here is something that would work for folks with with and without color blindness. So if you still like to use your bright colors, you can play with how bright they are essentially. The next big thing in design is font size. Uh, believe it or not, uh, disability advocates actually recommend 36 for the font size. Um, this is also a standard font size for the paragraph on a a poster printout. So if you're doing poster presentations, it's a good size. ADA suggests nothing less than 18. Disability advocates suggest that 22 really is safe for all fonts because all fonts have different sizes to consider. Um, so some fonts are smaller than others by default. Um, if you've ever used Calibri, you know it's very tiny. Um, if you've ever used Comic Sans, it can be a little bit beefier. So 22 is always going to make sure that your um, your font is legible to most to most viewers. Another thing to consider is the actual typeface itself. Uh, believe it or not, Comic Sans um, was designed for people with dyslexia. Um, that's why teachers have a tendency to use it because they were all taught to do that in the 90s. Fully understand that might not be everyone's design cup of tea. Uh, Verdana itself is really great. Roboto is considered one of the best accessible fonts. Things that aren't quite as accessible, right, are going to be things that look like handwriting, anything where you have this sort of really similar letter shape um, can be really difficult for folks to parse through um, if they have any, any dysmorphia around being able to see letters on a screen. The other thing is spacing. Uh, I, I, was, I was raised in a journalism program in high school. Uh, we did justified typeface for everything because of newspapers. Turns out that's awful for people um, who have reading disabilities. The spaces make it really confusing where words need to be. Letting it be, uh, you know, just a standard left justified is totally fine. Um, so, and I also, all of these very cute examples are from the controversy of accessible type by Alex Chen, which is, there is a, there is a little printout that goes with it. Um, it's a really helpful guide. The other thing as well is adding spaces between bullet points, spaces between texts. Um, I know a lot of us come from, you know, double spacing everything, but actually having your actual bullet points, having some separation, um, but still together for the actual piece makes it the most legible for the most readers. Another thing to consider um, is where captions are going to appear. I think especially in our post Zoom moment, um, one of the things that I get a lot of questions about now is, hey, I noticed that my captions cover my bullet points on my PowerPoint. Is there any way to move the captions? And my answer is always, unfortunately, there's no way to move captions. Captions appear in a standardized format and space that was designated by, you know, FDA compliance. <laughs> Uh, for broadcast network television. Um, however, you can choose where your bullet points appear um, in your design. So I've included this PowerPoint border system that actually comes from um, television standards. And so basically, you always want to make sure that your text 
is inside this bulleted area. Um, and that's going to ensure that captions will always have this safe zone underneath to appear. Now, some people might make their captions bigger or smaller, that kind of thing, but people are not able to change where their captions appear. That's, that's standardized in the software. Um, and this is just a way to make sure that even if you're doing live transcription instead of a Zoom, your captions are appearing in a space where they can always be legible and not covering any of your important information or images. Okay. All right. And all of this brings us to one of the most important parts of discussing images, um, which is alternative text, also known as alt text. Um, and this is going to create a short description of an image that's on your screen. Uh, this makes any of your visual information accessible by people who are using screen readers, uh, people who might be using um, you know, a PDF reader uh, because they're a student who have difficulty sitting and reading a book for a long time, anything like that. Um, but to demonstrate this, I'm actually going to click out and get meta for another moment. And if I right click on my image here, I can see that I have an option that says alt text. And if I click it, I get this wonderful little pop up and I have a screenshot showing where to find the alt text option in the sub menu on Google Slides. And in this case, it was the eighth option from the top. So you can see this right here. I also included an alt text for my highlight. So it says alt text highlight or red square or red rectangle <laughs> highlighting the alt text option on a sub menu. Um, and that is something that if someone was using a screen reader, it would read out loud for folks. One of the big things that I see a lot with folks who are starting to do alt text for the first time is that they usually will write a few words and just say like alt text on sub menu. Um, but I've been told that actually for it to sound and flow like the rest of the information on a slide, it's best to write it as an actual short description, sometimes as one or two sentences. Typically, you don't want them to be over 150 words, um, I've heard. so. Um, and this text becomes embedded into the image and will carry over if you make a PDF. It will carry over if you export to PowerPoint. It'll, it's something you can also do in PowerPoint if that's what you're using or Keynote. All of the software for presentations have the ability to create alt text. Um, and it's essential um, for anyone who's doing presentations. Okay. Um, and let me get back into presentation mode. And then I also will get a lot of questions um, about balancing images and text. Um, and the truth is that there's not really a right answer. A lot of it will be based on the circumstances of your actual presentation. Um, bullets are can be really helpful for people with attention deficit disorders who might miss what you're saying and want to follow through. And at the same time, uh, really you know, big visual aids can be helpful for people with reading disabilities to have something that's helping them make sense of the written words. All of that being said, walls of text are never going to be clear. You're going to want to break them up. Uh, that's why something like the font size and spacing, you could have all your different beats broken up across different slides. Um, and it's there's no shame in having a few more slides if it's really important information. Um, I know that there was a big movement for a while for folks to only have an image on screen and not even have a title. Um, I find that that makes your presentation materials not as helpful <laughs> for after the fact. Um, and having some information written in text form can be really helpful. Um, so like I said, a lot of it's context, a lot of it's thinking about the different audiences like Stacy was talking about, but I didn't want to come down hard one way or the other and say, never have any bullet points, only ever have images or vice versa. Um, just really thinking thoughtfully about what it's communicating and why you're using it. And then I'm going to pass this part over to Stacy. Yeah, okay. So thinking about all of this stuff and balancing your images and your text, one type of particular image that I spent a lot of time talking about in the past are these roadmaps. And so a roadmap is something that you can incorporate into your slides that really tells the reader where you are in your presentation. And the goal of this is to keep your audience engaged. So when we're thinking about our audiences and what they bring to the table and what they're doing, like a lot of times, you know, people are doing multiple things at a time. Like I know that when I sit down in a seminar, the 
pull to get out my phone and just check my email real quick is very, very strong. And so knowing that about our audiences, we can design elements of our presentations to enable them to check back in if they ever have a moment where they check out for whatever reason. And a roadmap is a fantastic way to do that. And so when we think about when to use these in terms of talks, I don't recommend using it for anything that is maybe even 30 minutes or less, because if you're talking for like something like a three minute thesis, or you're giving a 10 minute talk at a conference, folks should, you should be able to command their attention for 10 minutes and not need to tell them, first, we're gonna start at the intro, then we're gonna go here, then we're gonna go here, because your talk is short enough that you need all of that time to talk about your content and tell them the story that you're trying to tell them. For something like this, where we're talking for a considerable amount of time, Having this roadmap over here on the left lets our audience know where we are, where we've been, and where we're going. And so in this case, I used an actual road just to be a little bit on the nose with roadmaps. Uh, but you could see that all of the key points that we're hitting are there. And then this yellow circle is denoting where we are in the talk. I actually did not take time to explain to you what that was at the beginning because it's a road and it's a roadmap. And if you didn't know what it was, you could still understand what we were talking about as we were going along. However, the alt text for this yellow circle does explain why the yellow circle is there and why it's moving. And explaining your roadmap as part of your presentation is always helpful to your audience. You're giving them more tools to be successful. Another way that you can use a roadmap, if you're doing something like your thesis or a long series of experiments that look at similar time points. Um, okay, so we got a question in the chat about is there a way to link this roadmap to slide progression? And the only way that I know to do that is manual. So I have manually put this yellow circle in and I'll move it on the slides where it goes. What I did do, like he was mentioning earlier, was I embedded this roadmap into my theme so that anytime I have a new slide, I don't have to put this image in, provide alt text for the image. So it saves me a step or two. And you can do that with any image. And so what I have here in the center of the slide is another example of a roadmap, which is an experimental roadmap. And so this is explaining a series of time points that I did experiments at and what was happening in the rat brain at those times. And so if I'm explaining the methods of my research, this is particularly important because this is something I'm gonna to refer to over and over again. But by taking the time to create this graphic and then explain it in depth in the methods section of the seminar that I'm giving, if I was to then show you a version of this graphic that just had one of the time points boxed in red, you would know that I was then talking about data related to that time point because we've gone through this process together and I've given you this roadmap. So this is then a tool for you to stay engaged in the data that I'm giving you and be able to easily check back in in terms of what time point the experiments are showing. Okay, so those are just two different ways that you can use roadmaps. The thing to think about with them is that they are tools for your audience to stay engaged with your content. And I'm going to demonstrate how the alt text was added. So if you look, if I click on the actual graphic of the roadmap, it doesn't move, but this circle is movable um, and something that Stacy has added to the page and also added an alt text to say a yellow circle denoting a current section of the roadmap. And this is on the image section. And that's gonna become really handy because the next thing that we're talking about is going to be screen order and this is where <laughs> everything you've learned about powerpoint is just going to baffle your brain because this was one of the most uh surprising parts of learning about how i've been making my presentations inaccessible for decades so it turns out that the order of your materials in a slide matter not just in terms of your bullets appearing in a nice order when you animate them like stacy had for the first couple of slides but really the top layer is what's going to be read last by a screen reader so the thing that appears last on the screen is going to be the last thing that a screen reader hears and what this means is that the bottom layer the thing that is down there on the bottom 
is what's going to be read first by a screen reader. And this feels counterintuitive in some ways, and it makes sense once you've been doing it for a while. Um, but you can kind of think of about being building layers on a cake. The first layer you make of something is going to be on the bottom. And the screen reader is going to read that all the way up to the top. Elements that are in a theme will be considered decorative. And what that means is that they're not going to be read by a screen reader. So this is one of the advantages of putting an image um, into the theme, like a roadmap, because all that it understands is that the roadmap um, is a decorative element. And anything that's added to the slide is then something that can become highlighted. So this is really hard to understand um, without an example. And so Stacy has very kindly uh, offered a previous version of this very presentation um, as an example of what it sounds like uh, when you just sort of make your slides totally from scratch and have things like a beautiful roadmap and the actual source and link for your things and all of this. So I believe I'm sharing sound. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to play the recording of what it sounds like when this slide is read by screen reader. Talking to potential colleagues, black circle, black circle, black circle, black circle. Who do you share science with? Audience specific, tell a story, connect presentation tips. Talking to potential colleagues, black circle, black circle, black circle, black circle. Who do you share science with? Audience specific tell a story connect presentation tips in your discipline formality may very unlikely to be familiar with your work assessing you and there to answer questions for you https colon slash slash www.google.com slash url question essay equals i percent url equals https percent 3a percent 2f percent 2fpicryl.com percent 2f media percent 2f and aom idelgado dash Cruise dash a dash mechanical dash engineering dash senior dash at dash the dash polytechnic dash university 90 f0 fd ampersand sig equals a o v vol 0 2 o v r 1 d w 2 6 g 1 d p on 8 and news equals 1 6 2 3 7 8 3 7 9 8 9 7 3 0 0 0 and source equals images and cd equals fee and that equals 0 C A 0 Q G H X Q F O T C K C W K underscore O L underscore E C F Q A A A A A A A A A A B A U. So, uh, how how clear was that in terms of what the slide was actually about? Um, if anybody wants to to add into the chat, what was your what was your understanding of that slide? <laughs> right. <laughs> Not much, right? Black circle, black circle. <laughs> yes. I've never gotten that error before, and I just was really tickled by it. Um, so yeah, so this is, this. like I said, this is one of the, I think, like I said, for me, suddenly it all became very clear when people were like, your PowerPoints are inaccessible, right? Like if you've never experienced using a screen reader, how in the world could you imagine that's something that's super clear to us visually would sound like that when processed through a robot voice, right? And so some things that you know we noticed as Stacy and I were kind of chatting, because um, I actually hadn't used things like roadmaps in an accessible way before, was that you know Stacy used to copy and paste this entire beautiful roadmap onto each slide, and so one of the solutions was oh if we put it into the theme, it suddenly is understood as an image and it won't try and read it every time. So that was one of the first things. Um, the second thing, right, are what we call making usable our URL links. Um, and so very often it's really important to always keep a source, um, but we might want to make it a useful link. Um, and I'll show an example of what that is on the next slide and show you how to make one. Um, but the other big thing too is uh, you get that black circle error, apparently, if you add a text box that isn't understood to be a paragraph. Um, and so that's one of the things that uh, using a theme will really help with. 
is telling the computer, hey, by the way, this is going to be a paragraph that I want you to read like you would a paragraph. Um, and one of the final things, right, is that we had found out that apparently this yellow on white is not accessible for text. Um, it, the contrast ratio is too low, so we changed that. So this is our better example. And I say better, not good, uh, because I think there's always spaces to improve. As I mentioned, Stacy and I are still learning a ton about this. Um, and uh, I wanted you to hear what it sounds like um, to have the screen order in the right direction. So I'm going to play this other example. This yellow circle represents where we are in the roadmap. Now in the audience specific section, talking to potential colleagues in your discipline. Formality may vary. Unlikely to be familiar with your work. Assessing you and there to answer questions for you two students in lab coats look intently at a beaker at a lab bench. They are participants in a 10-week summer research program at the Naval Research Laboratory. Mage source, P-I-C-R-Y-L. So still not perfect, but what, what does that, um, <laughs> how is this slide different than the previous one in terms of the way that the screen reader is, is handling the information? No black circles. <laughs> Reading a little bit more slowly. Or at least it feels like it, right? Clear, brief, easy to follow. It actually halved. It's like, I think it's like a third of the time that the original one took. And what it does is because it understands it as a paragraph with bullet points, it actually takes a breath between each of those. Um, there's an alt text image description for both the actual image as well as the yellow circle. Um, I played around with the screen order a little bit, and it seemed to make the most sense to have the roadmap introduced first as the sort of cue into what we're working on, and then going into the title. Um, and right, I'm not giving them a big link. I'm doing this pick YRL. Um, and I've gotten asked before um, how you can make... Oop. Well, if it wants to let me use my... Oh, that's because that's an image that would do it. Um, I will show how to make a shorter URL in just a second. I was so convinced that, that was my actual slide uh, that I had <laughs> clicked on it. Um, like I said, I, I think really hearing that screen order difference just just helps really bring it all home why these things that seem so minute <laughs> are actually really, really important. Because um, like I said, we can't assume all of our audiences are experiencing information the same way that we are. Um, and then the final thing that I wanted to just mention um, was exporting accessible PDFs. Um, I know a lot of people, myself included for a while, who do the pr print to PDF as your as your way of creating a PDF really easily out of something like um, uh, Google Chrome or Firefox, or even if you're in a Word doc or something like that. Um, you actually always want to make sure that you're going through the actual software's uh, PDF making ability. So in Microsoft Word, there's an actual export to PDF option that wouldn't take you through the print dialog. In PowerPoint, there's an export to PDF option if you go to file share. Um, one of the big things is that when you do the print to PDF solution, it actually unbakes, it takes all that metadata out that's like, this is an image, this is a paragraph, because it's just flattening it down into a single image. Um, and so that's just something to uh, have in the back of your mind is like, have I gone through the software's way of making a PDF? Um, shout out to PowerPoint for having the most accessibility features ever. Um, I actually will download my Google Slides as PowerPoints to run them through PowerPoint's accessibility checker. Um, I think it's one of the most effective uh, for just making a lot of those steps really clear. Um, and like I said, this is really if you're thinking about making materials for a big conference, things that are going to be posted online and available to the public, um, different things like that. Um, but the big thing is, is just making sure that all your images have alt text and that the screen order, the you know what appears first and what appears last, is how you want it to be for someone going through your slides. Um, and it can just make a whole, a whole lot of difference. 
So um, if anyone ever has questions about making PDFs, uh, always feel free to come and find me. Um, and I will just jump off of here for a second because this is an example of a useful URL link. Um, if I was to click and hold on this, there's an option for link. Um, and I could actually have it go to a website or something. So this could go to www.microsoft.com or something, right, for making accessible PDFs there. Um, but that is going to create a useful link versus showing the whole URL. Um, and you can copy and paste a link into that. Now, which is kind of weird and also a little scary, but you know, sometimes it helps you out. Um, <laughs> it's true. So, if anyone has any other questions, uh, I think we've built in a little bit of time for those. I'm happy to show any of the tools related to color contrast uh, or anything like that. Um, yep. But I think for right now, I will. Should I stop sharing my screen? Would that be helpful? Yeah, why don't you go ahead and stop sharing your screen, guys? I'm sharing an evaluation with you in the chat right now that's just for today's talk. It helps us learn about what you guys want to hear from VCU libraries and from the how to talks. So if you have a moment before you head off to your next thing to just fill that out, it should take no more than two minutes. Um, and then if you have any questions, feel free to unmute yourselves or throw them in the chat. We have time and we are excited to talk about all things presenting. Oh, and I'm also going to put a link to the upcoming how to talks into the chat so you guys can check those out. Our first one by a postdoc is on Monday and that will be Dr. Arnithia Sutton and she'll be talking about utilizing Twitter in your scientific career and other social media. Okay. Sharing, thank you, Allie. What about sharing your speaker notes as a resource for additional information? And how does text within speaker notes work with screen readers? Keys, I'm gonna put the text within speaker notes right over yeah. to you, friend. Yeah, um, so when you do a PDF, I don't believe it shares your speaker notes. And actually I do have an answer for your speech question just as of today, so I'll share my, <laughs> share my screen um because i was digging around in the settings um so if you're in something like google slides um and you go to tools there is this option for accessibility settings and you actually have to turn this is off by default so if you turn on screen reader support or, or direct people to do that um, they will be able to access speaker notes. Um, so this is one of the big things that's a distinction is like if you've made, if you've used Google Slides and you want people to be able to screen read in the speaker notes, they actually have to turn that on on their Google Slides. Um, lots of people don't know that's hiding there. I know I didn't. Um, and so what it will do is it will give you this accessibility tab. And then it will give you, if you're using screen reader software, which someone who's using a screen reader would, it'll allow them to connect. But for whatever reason, this accessibility tab is not there by default. It has to be enabled by going to tools and turning that on. And just to make it clear, that's not something that you can turn on for somebody. That individual person will need to turn that on for Google Slides. <clears throat> but you can at least let them know that that is an option and that you have your speaker notes available and that they're more than welcome to use them. So that's a great question. Um, <clears throat> I've also heard sometimes it can be useful to provide like a, a Word document or a Google Doc that includes all of your speaker notes. Uh, that can be a little extra work. Um, so you can kind of decide if you just want to say, hey, I have speaker notes. Feel free to turn on the accessibility features in Google Slides. This is how you do that. Um, or providing it to them as a Word document on its own. Um, but it's a great question, and I feel like Google Slides could just maybe make that on by default, but you know, <laughs> I'm not their UI people. So that's actually a really great question. Uh, my understanding is that commas, semicolons, and periods do add pauses, as does having um, properly formatted bullet points. Um, so it does try to understand punctuation. Um, if you add double spaces, it does not take a breath, um, that kind of thing. Um, I think if you hit the enter tab, 
uh, it takes a small breath as well. So if it's going to a new line, um, but yeah, I think there is a added for punctuation, the newest sort of Siri-like voices. So Keith, can I ask you for the bullet points, the reason that the black circle, black circle, black circle disappeared, that was because we had used a properly formatted text box and let a slide layout, right? So that was all, that all tied back to the theme. Yeah, that and was because what the I theme, had done, yeah. Because previously I had just made a text box and then added bullets. And so they like didn't know, the screen reader didn't know why there were bullets there, right? Right. It, it, if anything, when it got flattened to a PDF, text boxes that are untagged, which is what that that is, mm -hmm. um, just get essentially flattened into their own separate elements. So even each line of text, even if it was its own line, uh, so like, let's say you had uh, one phrase that went across two lines, it mm -hmm. actually understands it as two separate text elements as well. <laughs> so it's like, it's like thinking about each line is now its own thing. These like weird circles are their own things. I'm confusion. Uh, yeah. Whereas if it's tagged properly, which is the term for when you use something like a theme with the, with the layout for the paragraphs, mm -hmm. it understands like, oh, hey, you've entered here and there's this circle. Now I understand this as a bullet point because you've told me I'm a paragraph box. <laughs> gotcha. It's, so it's then because they're second, not smart. So yeah. So then my second follow-up question is like, so if we have all this content that is completely inaccessible, which no one like I have a ton of, let's be honest, I'm asking for myself now. So if you have a ton of con content that is inaccessible, is it easier to try and convert the stuff that you've already made or to have a new presentation and bring over the content, but bring over the content like one at a time into the right boxes. Yeah, um, I think sometimes it depends. Uh, I, I am someone who uh, used to and still do approach PowerPoints as a sort of artistic practice. <laughs> so all my slides were like custom everything. Um, mm -hmm. I have found it easier to rehouse by copying and pasting the content into a new slide template. Um, if you, yeah, I think I think that's the way to make it the most consistent and make sure everything's in the right spaces. Uh, sometimes it gets really confused when you try and bring a text box and then apply a style to it. Um, mm -hmm. It's a really great mm -hmm. question. I think it really depends on if you would rather do a big bulk change and go and change a bunch of small things or just have the same consistent process the whole way through. <laughs> and you're just doing the same copy and paste process the, the whole way. Whereas the first one would have like a, I've converted everything, now I have to go change each slide. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it, it comes down to personal preference there, but I find it easier to like choose a new theme, have my old PowerPoint pulled up and then just copy and paste the text into their new, their new homes. Word. So. It's a great question. And like I said, you know, I, I try to I try to also encourage people to not beat themselves up too much about not knowing how a screen reader reads because we're not we're not taught that. You can't know what you don't know. Um and you know, I I would say, you know, if you're curious about this presentation and this process, a place to start is actually with your favorite presentation, like one that you really care about and want as many people to understand. And I found once I did it for one, it became a lot easier to do for, for follow-up ones. Um, but don't feel like you can't use a presentation that's completely inaccessible. Um, you can just now go in with the knowledge of saying, hey, uh, you know, I know this, this presentation isn't formatted for a screen reader. If you have any need, please let me know and I can, I can make that a priority for you. Um, also, if it's a class material for any of the people who are faculty here, if you have PowerPoints that aren't accessible, um, SEO, the Office of Student Accessi Student Accessibility and Educational Opportunity, um, they will actually help with some of those conversion processes if it's for a student who has accommodation and accommodation request. Um, so that can be really helpful too. They'll, they'll auto not automate some of that, but but help you convert them. So, but I don't know if they would do that for your science presentations at a conference. <laughs> So, um. All right, well, in the spirit of giving everybody a couple of minutes before their next meetings, 
Um, I'm going to say thank you again so much for coming. Please check out the other how-to talks that we have coming up next month. Once again, I'm Dr. Stacey Wall, the liaison to the basic sciences at the Health Sciences Library. And my colleague, Oscar Keys is the multimedia teaching and learning librarian at Cabell Library. And we're more than happy to answer any of your questions or follow up one-on-one -on -one with all of your scientific storytelling needs. Okay, have a great day, guys.